certainly will see by the end of uh, today's summit. The Biden administration has made a once in a lifetime investment in the nation's infrastructure and communities through the passing of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. These investments are primarily funded through assistance agreements or grants, otherwise known as, uh, rebates and loans. The Environmental Protection Agency has always had a, um, a robust grant program open to our state and tribal partners, nonprofits, and institutes of higher education, but the opportunities that these two laws afford are truly historic. Today, we're gonna to share with you how to find, apply for, and manage federal grants. While some of the information presented today is specific to EPA and EPA grants, much of what we share can be applied for seeking and applying to other federal agencies and um, their grant programs as well. So today's session will be presented by two talented EPA Region 3 grant specialists who award and administer EPA grants on a daily basis and are truly experts in this topic. So I'm so happy they're here with us today, Haley McElpine and Basima Patterson. So I'd like to turn the mic over to Haley to kick off our session. Great, thanks Jackie. Um, my name is Haley McAlpine. As Jackie said, I'm a grant management specialist here at EPA Region 3, and I will get us started today. Um, so I wanted to start off by going over today's agenda with everyone. Um, I'll present on how to find and apply for EPA grants and give you some tips on how you can stay informed. Then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Basima Patterson, who will walk us through the application and award process, give us some insight on how you can create a budget detail and offer some best practices for grant management. At the end of today's session, we should have about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, I know it's gonna be a lot of information and it'll probably raise a lot of questions. So we encourage you to please put your questions in the chat as you think of them, and we'll do our best to answer all the questions at the end of today's session. Um, I should also note that this slide deck is packed full of live links. It's going to be a great resource for you to use going forward when you're looking for grants um, and hopefully managing your successful grants. Um, so this slide deck, as well as a recording of today's presentation, will be available on the EPA Region 3 website in a few weeks. Um, so please check back for that. Uh, without further ado, let's get started and learn about how to find and apply for EPA grants. Um, so before we get too deep into the content, I wanted to let you know that because we only have about 60 minutes with you today, some of what we talk about might be a little bit brief or a high level overview, but don't let that deter you. Um, EPA has a ton of phenomenal grant related uh, resources that are available for you today. So on the left, you can see some of our grant related trainings. These are modules that you can click through. And on the right are the EPA grant related webinars. Um, you might notice that several of these webinars have actually been released within the last two months. So this is really current, up-to-date information that's gonna be super helpful, offering a deeper dive on some of the more um, complicated topics in grant management. Um, so just to give you a general overview of what the application process looks like at EPA, it all starts with an EPA program office preparing a funding opportunity, i.e. an announcement of an open grant round. Um, they'll post that open funding opportunity to grants.gov where folks like you will be able to apply. Um, at the close of the application period, EPA will take all of the applications they've received, they'll evaluate those applications and make some decisions. Um, those successful applicants will be issued EPA grant awards. So I'm sure you're wondering, how do I get to that finish line and be one of those successful applicants? And that all starts with finding an open funding opportunity. Um, so if you're new to EPA grants or just new to federal grants in general, and you want um, general information about the types of programs we offer, I would suggest that you head on over to SAM.gov and peruse our assistance listings. Some of you might know these as the CFDA or the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance. It's the same thing. The federal government recently rebranded the CFDA as assistance listings. Um, so these are not open funding opportunities, but instead they'll give you a really great overview of the different types of grant programs EPA has to offer. They'll tell you the types of projects that these programs fund, the eligible entities, and more. 
Um, we also have a great link here to just a general list of the EPA competitive grant programs. So if you're just, just starting out, you're looking for information, SAM.gov is a great place to start. So when you're ready to actually start applying for grants, you'll want to look for open funding opportunities. The best place to start is grants.gov. You'll be able to see all funding opportunities, not only for EPA, but for all federal agencies. Um, and these funding opportunities will tell you the application requirements, deadlines, and more. Grants.gov is also the website where you're actually gonna be submitting your application. Um, for those of you that might be a little more familiar with EPA, you know some, some about the program offices that we have here. Um, you might think, hey, we have a, a project in our community that the Office of Air and Radiation might be able to help us fund. You could keep an eye on the Office of Air and Radiation's website where they will also post all of their open funding opportunities. But anything that's posted on the program office website will also be posted on grants.gov. So if you're looking for more of a one-stop shop type of place, grants.gov is gonna be the place to go. So let's take a look. Um, on your screen here, you can see the a screenshot of the grants.gov homepage. And we have two tabs highlighted here for you. Um, the first is the search grants tab. That's actually where you're gonna be looking for open funding opportunities. You can use a variety of different search filters to help whittle down a list of opportunities that you might be able to apply for. Um, you'll also see that we have the connect tab highlighted here. The connect tab is where you'll be able to sign up for the free grants.gov subscription service. These notifications will let you know of any new funding opportunities that might open up, if um, any funding opportunities you're interested in have been modified. It's a great service um, and I'll talk about a little bit more about it in a few slides. So let's get started with the search grants tab. Okay, um, so when you click on that tab, this is the screen you'll see. Um, you'll get maybe an overwhelming amount of funding opportunities to sift through, and that's where these search filters are gonna come in really handy. Um, so you can search by keyword. If you happen to know the funding opportunity number or the assistance listing number, you can certainly search that way. Um, but if you're looking for a more general list of funding opportunities and you know you wanna work with EPA, I would suggest that you use that agency filter down at the bottom left. Um, if you search by all environmental protection agency grants, you'll get a short list of all of the EPA funding opportunities that are open today. I do wanna give a word of caution against using the eligibility filter. While it might seem um, to make total sense if you're a city or township government, for instance, to click that box and only look for opportunities that city or township governments are eligible to apply for. Um, however, EPA will generally use other as the eligibility um, type, and that other could include a variety of organization types, including city and township governments. So if you use an eligibility filter, you might inadvertently filter out some opportunities you actually are eligible to apply for. So definitely try the agency filter, stay away from the eligibility filter. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how to read these funding opportunities. You get your short list of EPA funding opportunities and you can click through them. Um, and each funding opportunity is gonna have a set of unique specific instructions. Um, if you've read one, you have not read them all. Each one is a little bit different. So we encourage you to please read these very carefully and closely so that you understand what's expected of you as an applicant. Um, these announcements will include the eligibility information, deadlines, application content, the review criteria that the program office will use to make selections, and more. Um, it's important to note that many of these funding opportunities are only open for 45 days. So for our government and nonprofit partners out there, um, I think you'll, you'll know that 45 days sometimes is not a lot of time. Oftentimes it feels like the blink of an eye. Um, so it's important that you check grants.gov often, sign up for those uh, subscriptions so that you can be notified when new opportunities open up so you can have that full 45 day application period. Um, I also wanted to note that EPA will occasionally modify funding opportunities. So maybe they'll push the deadline back or they'll clarify some of the requirements. Um, any modification to a funding opportunity is posted on grants.gov. And if you sign up for those grants.gov notifications, you will be notified if a funding opportunity you're working on has been modified. So again, use that connect tab, sign up for the notifications. They're gonna be super helpful. 
Okay, let's look at a real life funding opportunity. So this is an open funding opportunity offered through EPA right now. Um, you can see that this opportunity is open until June 20th. So we wanted to give you kind of a live example to look at. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see a lot of information about the type of grant it is, um, how many awards the program office is expecting to make this grant round, and if there's a cost share requirement. On the right, you'll be able to see um, a lot of information, including information that will tell you if this posting has been modified, which in this case it has. That version says Synopsis 2. Um, that's an indicator that this is the second iteration. And you can also see that the posted date is March 8th, but the last updated date is March 13th. That means that this posting has been modified. Um, so if you want to see what's changed, you can click that version to history tab up at the top. It's a blue tab. <clears throat> and I'll call your, your attention back over to that right-hand column um, where you can see the closing date for applications, the total amount of funding that the program has for this grant round, which is $8 million, um, the award ceiling, which is in this case $1.2 million, that's the most amount of money that an individual organization can apply for, and the award floor, which would be the minimum amount of money that you can apply for. Um, up at the top, you see that red apply button. So again, grants.gov is where you actually apply for grants. Um, and you'll be able to click through that related documents tab and the package tab to get all of the details about what's expected in your grant application package. So again, I just wanna put in another plug for that grants.gov subscription service. Um, using the connect tab at the top of the grants.gov home screen, you can sign up for these notifications. So you can request to be spent to be sent um, notifications of new funding opportunities, and you can also sign up for notifications about any modification to a funding opportunity you might be working on. This is gonna come in handy with those short open windows. If you only have 45 days, let's say you sit down at your desk on a Friday afternoon, pull up grants.gov and you see a funding opportunity that sounds like a great fit for your community and it opened on the previous Monday. You've already lost four or five days um, in the process just because you didn't check it the right day. But if you sign up for the grants.gov subscription service, you sit down at your desk Monday morning, you have a lovely email in your inbox letting you know that there's a funding opportunity you might be interested in. And boom, you get those full 45 days to work on your application. <clears throat> so if you are serious about your grant searching endeavor, um, I highly recommend utilizing this subscription service through grants.gov. Okay, I want to take a minute to pause and give you a very critical piece of information. Before you can apply for any open funding opportunity, you have to be registered in both SAM.gov and Grants.gov. Um, registration for these websites can take about 30 days to process. So again, if that funding opportunity is only open for 45 days, you're losing a lot of time just trying to get registered. So with that said, I recommend that you go ahead and get your organization registered in SAM.gov and Grants.gov today. Um, even if you're not applying for a grant today, tomorrow, next week, next month, at least these registrations are in place and ready for you when the right opportunity opens up. So let's talk a little bit about registering for SAM.gov. Um, you do have to register for SAM.gov first. And part of that registration will assign your organization a UEI. That's a unique entity identifier. Some of you might be familiar with DUNS numbers. Um, DUNS numbers were replaced with UEIs in the last couple of years. So DUNS are out, UEIs are in, and you all need one if you want to apply for an EPA grant. Some of your organizations might actually have a UEI and not a SAM.gov registration you will need both. Um, so after today's summit, I would suggest you do a little bit of organizational digging and see if you have a UEI and a SAM.gov registration. If not, go ahead and get started with that. Okay, and then just a little bit about registering for grants.gov. So again, grants.gov is um, federal agency wide service. It's not specific to EPA. Um, so we do have a link here to a really good video that will walk you through the registration process. But if you have any questions or concerns or are confused about that, um, we recommend that you reach out to the grants.gov help desk and they can give you a hand in helping getting get your organization registered with grants.gov. Um, so again, register with SAM.gov first and then grants.gov and then you are ready to apply for open EPA funding opportunities. Okay, 
So after you're all registered um, and you're embarking on an application process, you might have a couple of questions about how you can communicate with EPA during the open application period. Um, because EPA strives to make sure that all of our competitive grant rounds are run fairly and ethically, giving all organizations an equal opportunity to um, receive funding, we are restricted in the way we're able to communicate with applicants. Um, so EPA can answer questions about eligibility. If you're not sure if your organization is eligible to apply for a grant, you can absolutely reach out to the point of contact on the funding opportunity um, to find out. If you're looking for some clarity on some administrative aspects of the proposal, EPA can help you there. EPA can also respond to requests for clarification of the opportunity. So like we saw with that funding announcement um, that had been modified, it was like they were likely the result of the clarification that EPA wanted to issue for all applicants to see. Um, so if the funding opportunity is going to be modified, a clarification will be issued, it will be modified for everyone and posted on grants.gov. Um, some things that EPA cannot do. So we cannot help you write your grant application, um, nor can we review or comment on grant, grant applications. We can also not provide any information about the evaluation process outside of what's already listed on that funding opportunity. And finally, we can't provide any one organization with a competitive advantage over another. We wanna make sure that everybody has the same shot. Okay, so you've applied, what now? Your blood, sweat, and tears went into that application. You hit submit, it's out in the grants.gov ether. Um, what happens next? So after the close of the application date, um, the EPA program office will review all of the applications. They'll score them using um, an established scoring criteria and make some selections on who they'd like to fund. Those applicants who are found ineligible or are not selected for funding do have 15 days to request a debrief. We highly recommend that you take advantage of this debrief. You'll be able to hear what the strengths of your application were and also what some of the weaknesses were or the areas that you could improve upon for next time. This will set you up well when you come to reapply next year. Um, you'll know not to make some of the same mistakes that you might have made with your first application. Those applicants that are successful, yay, you will be um, notified and instructed on your next steps. But I do wanna give a word of caution here. That selection notification is not your green light to start work. Um, there is a secondary review process that happens after applications are selected for funding. You'll be working with your grant specialist and your project officer. It could take anywhere from two to four months to complete that secondary review. Um, and at that point, we'll be able to issue a, for a formal notice of award. Only that formal notice of award signed by an EPA award official um, allows you to begin spending your grant funds. Any costs that your organization incurs prior to that official notice of award are incurred at your own risk. So if you're not sure when you can start work, please reach out to your project officer or your grant specialist and ask questions. You don't wanna end up um, spending money that can't be reimbursed. Okay, um, and then I just wanted to speak for a moment to our nonprofit partners out there that are applying for grant funds that exceed $200,000. If you are successful and you receive a grant award that exceeds $200,000, you are required to go through the pre-award certification process with EPA. This process is designed to make sure that all of our nonprofit recipients have the adequate administrative systems in place to be able to successfully manage their EPA grant funds. Um, this process is initiated after that selection notification, but before we can make your official award. Um, so EPA will reach out to you to work through that process. Super important that you are responsive, timely, and thorough um, with your replies back to EPA during this process. As Jackie noted, we are granting out um, historically high levels of funding right now, which means that the pre-award certification process might take a little bit longer than usual. So your timely and thorough responses will go a long way to helping us move that process along a little more quickly. Um, if you have questions about pre-award certification, we do have a link to the pre-award certification website at the bottom, and EPA also launched a really great technical workshop on this process just um, last month, so we have a link to that as well. 
Okay, so that was a lot of information, a lot of detail, and not a lot of time. So we wanted to offer you these um, key takeaway segments after each section of today's presentation, so that if you um, if your head is spinning, you're trying to you know figure out what was important to remember. These are some some of the main points to take home with you today. If you're looking for just general grant program info, you'll want to look at the assistance listings on SAM.gov. When you're ready to find and apply for open funding opportunities, you'll head over to grants.gov. You need that SAM.gov and grants.gov registration in place before you can submit any applications, and that can take up to 30 days, so go ahead and get started now. Um, if you are successful with your application, that notice of selection is not your green light to start work. You need to wait until you get your official grant award. And finally, nonprofit partners will be um, with awards over 200,000 will be required to go through pre-award certification. Oops. Okay, so now I'd like to offer you some tips and tricks on how you can stay informed about all things EPA grants. Um, the best resource out there is to sign up for the EPA Grants Update Listserv. Um, you will receive any uh, notifications about any and all things grants, including new grant guidance or information, any new trainings or webinars that we release. So like you saw um, a few slides ago, we did have quite a few new webinars come out this spring, so you'll be notified via email if you sign up for the Listserv. Um, you'll also be notified of any changes in grant management requirements and any other pertinent general grants information. So we do have a link there to the listserv um, if, you're, if you're interested in registering. Again, I wanted to call your attention over to um, the variety of grant trainings and webinars that APA has available to you now. On the left are those grant related trainings. These are modules that you click through kind of like an online class. Um, and then on the right hand side, we do have our webinar series. Okay, and then just a few more resources. If you're interested in learning more about the competition process, we have a link there. Um, if you have questions about grants.gov, we have a variety of resources on the left-hand side of your screen. And then finally on the right, we have information about our RAINS. That is the Recipient Applicant Information Notice. Um, so these could include new guidance, new policy changes, important information about grants management. Um, and those are also communicated via that listserv. So if you don't wanna have to keep checking different websites, go ahead and register for the listserv and it'll all come straight to your inbox. So, okay, that does it for me for now. I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Basima Patterson, and she will get us going on the application and award process. Thank you, Haley. Next, we will discuss the application and award process. This slide lists the documents required to apply for a grant. The 6600-6 form may be listed as optional, but if your grant is over $100,000, the form is required. If you do not submit the 6600-6 form, the project officer will contact you to submit the form. Having all the required documents prevents a delay in the process to award the grant. In your application package, the work plan should be included. The work plan should be based on funding opportunity guidance and consistent with federal rules, regulations, statutes, EPA orders, and delegates. The work plan should have detailed descriptions defining the environmental outcomes, timeframes for completion, and reporting schedule. This slide lists other items required in your work plan. If the work plan is not deemed appropriate by EPA personnel that is reviewing it, the work plan can be asked to, revise, to be revised to fall into the work plan guidelines. Next, you will see a work a flow chart for the grant process. This flow chart, this is a flow chart of the overall process of a grant from when the grant is submitted through grants.gov until the award process is processed and signed. Just a note, PO means project officer and GS means grant specialist. The review process can be long or short. If the grant specialist has no issues after their review, the process is short and the grant can go to the next step. But when there are issues and the, the process is longer, issues can vary from budget problems, work plan, plan errors, 
the UEI number does not match in SAM.gov. Grant issues can be numerous other things. This is when the grant specialist and project officer contacts the recipient to make those changes. It is important to try to get those corrections back to the project officer as soon as you can. The longer it takes to get the corrections, the longer it delays the grant. Once the review is complete and funds are available, the award document can be created and signed for approval. The budget detail should be reasonable and allowable. The budget detail is a breakdown of categories of how the budget for the project will be spent. The budget category should only be whole dollars. They should not have cents. Adding cents or change to your budget is a surefire way to have the project officer contact you about errors that need to be corrected. I will provide a brief detail of all the categories, starting with personnel and fringe benefits. Personnel costs should include the salaries of all employees working attached to the project, and it should match the staffing plan on the budget narrative in your work plan. Fringe benefits are costs that are not income, such as sick leave, holiday pay, etc. These should be identified in great detail in your budget, in great detail in your budget narrative. You should have a fringe policy that states what should be included. If you require help calculating the fringe rate, you can click the link to assist you in the fringe rate calculations. Next, we go to travel. Travel is a projection of travel costs associated with the project. This is necessary for employees to perform the work. Travel should be reasonable and allowable. Travel for contractors or consultants should be included as a contract cost, not travel. Next up are two categories that bring on many discussions. Equipment and supplies always seems to draw issues. Although they are similar, they are still different. Equipment is a long-term asset that will cost $5,000 and lasting greater than one year or more. And supply should be less than $5,000 in the budget category. Contractual services are those services to be carried out by an individual or organization other than the recipient that has established a contractual relationship. Contractual should be any cost for which you would have written a contract associated to the project. Do not name specific contractors or consultants directly into your application package. The other category should be used only when the cost does not fit into another category. Subawards are under the other category. A subaward is an award of financial assistance to a sub-recipient to carry out part of the EPA funded project, even if the recipient provides the assistance under the term contract. Indirect costs incurred by the grantee to benefit more than one cost objective or project. The indirect cost rate must be up to date for the life of the grant. Recipients that have never had an indirect cost rate are eligible, eligible to use the 10% de minimis rate. If there are any questions pertaining to the indirect cost rate, there is a link to the policy on the slide. That was a lot of information that we might need big takeaways. If by chance you missed something important, here are some key takeaways. I cannot emphasize this point more. Double check your math. Whole dollar amounts are your friend. No sense. Provide a detailed budget narrative with breakdowns for costs. Don't name specific contractors or consultants directly in your application package. This leads us to some best practices for grants management. Practice makes perfect. Here are some best practices for grants management. 
congratulations. You are receiving your award. What now? When you receive your award grant award via email, there are things you should know. The recipient accepts the terms of award within 21 days after the EPA award or amendment or not filing a notice of disagreement with the award terms and conditions within 21 days after the EPA award milling date. Next, we talk about the terms and conditions. You know those commercials and at the end of the commercial, they tell you all the side effects and terms of whatever they are endorsing. Well, at the end of your award are the terms and conditions. Unlike the commercial, you can and should read through them. The terms and conditions will tell you all you need to know about reporting requirements, drawdowns, audit requirements, and more. It is your job to become familiar with the terms and conditions. Ignorance is not an excuse for non-compliance. You ever say to someone, well, I didn't know. In this case, that's not a good reason. The terms and conditions come with each grant award. There is no excuse not to know. If you have questions about your terms and conditions, you can reach out to the project officer or grant specialist with questions. Their contact information is on the grant award. Also, drawing down funds is considered accepting the terms and conditions. Now that you have accepted your grant and you know the terms and conditions, how do you get the money? That's what we will discuss next. You apply for the grant. You have your grant award. Now you want the grant funds to do the work. Show you the money, right? Grant funds must be drawn down from ASAP. When you draw down from ASAP, you should draw for the amount you need on an immediate cash basis. Do not draw all the money at the same time. It will raise a red flag. Administrative and programmatic reporting is required. They are listed in the terms and conditions. Subawards over $30,000 must be reported to FSRS.gov. If your budget is over $250,000, you must submit DBE reports. All grantees must submit their yearly federal financial reports and one at the end of the grant seat, grant at the end of the grant. Okay, that was a lot. Take a breath. What have we learned? Here are the key takeaways to help us with what we have learned. Recipients have 21 days to accept or file a disagreement with their award. Very carefully review all the terms and conditions. Only draw funds for what you need. Do not draw all the funds at once. Most of all, ask questions. Ask, ask, ask. If you don't know, the best way to find out is by asking a question. Reach out to the project offer project officer or grant specialist. Their contact information is listed on the award. Here are some links that are helpful in your process for applying for grants. And these are individuals you can contact if you have any questions. Keep in mind any grants.gov questions, you should contact the grants.gov help desk. The project officer and grant specialist cannot provide you with help for any grants.gov issues. Any questions? Please put your questions in the link, in the chat, in the link, in the chat. <laughs> Great job, Basima. Looks like we had a couple questions that were answered in the chat. But if anyone else has any questions at all or wants us to go back over anything, um, please drop it in the chat. And we're happy we've got plenty of time um, to re-review anything or answer any questions you guys might have. And on behalf of myself and Haley, we would like to thank you for taking the time to be a part of this presentation. We hope the information we provided better assists you with applying for federal grants with the Environmental Protection Agency. 
and we encourage you to attend the other sessions that are being held today. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Kelly and Basima, I was able to find an answer to the question about how will applicants be notified. They will be notified by the EPA program office that is making the award, I'm sorry, that is making the selection, um, that they weren't selected, and that will be sent to the signator on the grant application, and it will be within 15 days of making the determination. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we had a follow-up question. Does one have to be part of an organization to apply for a grant? Um, I, you need to be authorized by the organization. So if you're a grant writer or a consultant working with the organization, you'll need to work that out in terms of getting the right user permissions in their grants.gov profile. Um, but it will have to be associated with that organization's grants.gov and SAM.gov registration. That is correct. EPA does not make grants to individuals or to private organizations. Okay, I'm not seeing anything out. Oh, how do I get a get a link to links displayed today? Um, so the slide deck will be available on the EPA Region 3 website. Um, they said it could take two to three weeks and I believe that our contracting firm will be emailing all of the participants, um, letting you know when the recordings and the slide decks are available. Um, if for some reason you don't get that email um, or you don't hear from them, you can reach out to us uh, via email. I'm going to drop my email address in the chat. Um, and you can reach out to me and I can send you the slide deck as well. So that's there for you guys in the chat if you need it. <laughs> 